Hey, children, why don't you go ahead and come up here for our children's chat? Hey, you go ahead, Bobby, yes. Some of us belong in a children's chat. I'm one of them. What took you so long? I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Hey, what's going on, bro? Doing all right? Staying out of trouble? Wearing cool glasses? Oh, thank you for not lying about staying out of trouble. That's good. Well, hello. You snuck up over here while I was talking to him. You think those earrings will look good on my ear? Okay, thank you. I'm too scared to get it pierced anyway, so it don't really matter, you know. Hey, hey have y'all ever heard of the games Follow the Leader and Simon Says? So what's, what is it that you're supposed to do in those two games? Like follow the leader first. What are you supposed to do in that? So do whatever the leader does, okay? So like, so if, if we were following the leader, so like, like right now, follow me, okay? I'm the leader. And if I did this... What would you do? Okay. Same thing like me. So if I clap two times, how many times are you supposed to clap? Two times. Okay, very good. So I want to make sure that we understand follow the leader is you follow the leader. You do what the leader does exactly the way the leader does it, okay? So that's that game. How about Simon Says? What do you, what do, you do in the game Simon Says? So you do whatever Simon Says, but what's the special thing about you only do it if Simon says so. So like, for example, let's say, if I say, Simon says, raise both hands. You raise both hands. Why? Because I said, because Simon says that. I said, Simon says. But now, now make sure you, I didn't say put your hands down. Now, if I say put your hands down, but don't say Simon says, you keep your hands up and then I would be out. Very, very good. So simple games like that. So we're going to do follow the leader right now, okay? Have you all ever played follow the leader in a church building? No. Oh, have we done it in here before? We have, haven't we? Yeah, we're going to do it again. Okay? So y'all line up behind me. Y'all come and line up. We're following the leader, not Simon Says. Follow the leader. Everybody line up beside behind me. Okay, now turn this way because the leader turned this way. Okay? So look that way. So look, I'm the leader. Listen to me. Woohoo! Oh, you can do better than that. Woohoo! Now it's really important if you can't see me that you watch the person in front of you. And they've got to be doing the right thing. Look, y'all supposed to be y'all supposed to be jogging and running. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I'm going backwards. Oh, oh, good. We gotta sit down. You're not tired. I know you're not. You're young. Good job. Thank y'all. Now, did some of y'all not know that I was going backwards down that middle aisle? See, sometimes we start watching others. And we don't do what the leader's doing. That happens in the Christian life too. Sometimes we're following the wrong leader. Sometimes we're following people that don't know Jesus. And they're supposed to be leading us to Jesus. That's why we have the Bible. The Bible is God's perfect instructions. Jesus is the only leader that we ought to really be following. And so I want you to remember that from now on when you play Simon Says or you play Follow the Leader... Think about God's word and how we're to follow that and how we're to follow Jesus. Okay? Let's pray together. Father, let us model before these kids real faith so that we'd be lives worth following. Because we keep our eyes fixed upon you and we yield ourselves to your word anew because you are worthy. Amen. Thank you all so much for helping. So open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse... No, I'll tell you what, let's open it up to Matthew 5 first, verse 2. Matthew chapter 5, verse 2. A message I've entitled with a question, Is your faith 
the real thing. Today's message is unashamedly personal. Unashamed, a mirror into your soul. Souls hang in the balance today. And I just beg you not to gamble with your eternity. It doesn't matter how good a church member you've been. It doesn't matter what Christian experience you've had. Saved people look like it. Sound like it. Act like it. And by the grace of God, follow our leader, Jesus Christ. There is no shame if you are a leader at Yellow Creek and you have to admit today that you've never known Jesus. Because quite frankly, people know that you don't know Jesus. They know whether or not your life lives up to matches, not in perfection, but in desire. The clear teaching of the Word of God. Listen to just the Beatitudes. And he opened his mouth, verse 2, and he taught them saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter, utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Are you living the true blessings of brokenness over your sin? over your sin and the sin of others in our world? Or are you living a God-centered humility, a passionate desire to be right with and before God and others in every area of your life? Are you merciful and forgiving, pure and holy in your lifestyle? Do you make peace for others in God's ways with others and between others? Are you persecuted, lied about, hated because of your unashamed stand for God and his word against culture, especially the religious culture of our day? Are you rejoicing that you're being mistreated like the prophets of the Old Testament? You see, these characteristics Jesus has taught us are proof of true righteousness and true faith. The lack thereof is proof also of our worthless, fake, and false self-righteousness. Unless our righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, we will not enter the kingdom of heaven. At the end of the day, y'all, we must not live to please one another. Even ourselves. We must live to please him. The leader that we're saying that we follow. We must deny ourselves, take up our crosses daily and follow him. It's not convenient. It's not easy. It is impossible apart from the grace of God. You see, just using the Beatitudes as a mirror into, to your soul, your character in your life, you can ask yourself, you can tell yourself whether your faith is the real, real thing. Jesus has powerfully taught in this series the battle for true righteousness against self-righteousness, the truth of God and his word versus the truths, teachings, traditions, and opinions of the self-righteous religious person amongst us. Yellow Creek, every church is made up of real Christians and fake Christians. Every church. Which are you? What does your life, not your emotions, not your experiences, not your faith in your own faith, what does your life show that you're putting your faith and your hope and your trust for today, tomorrow, the days to come, and eternity really in? 
you and your abilities and your understanding or God and his ability and his understanding of what's right and what's wrong. There are two roads we've learned. One that leads to eternal life with Jesus. Then only a few will enter. And one that leads to hell and eternal destruction that many will find. We have seen that there are two trees. One healthy in Christ that produces good fruit. And one diseased, not in Christ, that produces bad, evil fruit. Why? Because our lives reveal our faith and our faithfulness come to you preaching this message with a heavy heart, praying that none will walk out of here in deception, that all will be humble enough to consider where they, where they really stand before a holy God, not trusting in your faith, trusting in Jesus Christ alone. Verse 21 in Matthew chapter 7 begins today's context. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, verse 22 says of Matthew 7, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. This is a terrifying and heartbreaking passage. People will die having had some sort of Jesus experience and think they're going to heaven. They are self-deceived in their dead self-righteousness, living in a false peace. Martin Lloyd-Jones warns us, he says, there's a danger of trusting your faith instead of trust of Christ, of trusting your belief without really becoming regenerate or born again. It's easy in the United States of America to claim to be a Christian. This isn't a problem that you have very many other places in the world. Because like in England, for example, no one cares about identifying themselves as a Christian. They've already given up on Jesus being the only way. Consider this with me. They have the right words. Lord, Lord. They know the Christian ease. They know the Christian words. They sound the part. Remember we learned that they are, they are wolves in sheep clothing. They bad just like everybody else does. They have the right words. Even here, they they have right works that Scripture describes as important and vital as part of God's agenda. It says, they prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many mighty works in your name. These are the many in Jesus' teaching that are saying these. They are church people. They are preachers. They are healers. They are teachers. They are so-called spirit-filled, doctrinally sound people who will not go to heaven. And you can't miss that. For some of you, this may be the first time you've ever heard this passage. For others of you, it may be the first time that you've understood that Jesus, God in human flesh, is teaching this to us to protect us from self-righteousness. He says, and then I will declare to them, verse 23, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness or iniquity. Why? Why? Because they have no personal faith relationship with Jesus Christ. I never knew you. By relationship or experience, the creator God of the universe, God in human flesh, has not been brought brought into a personal love relationship with you through repentant gospel faith. You are still acting as your God and your Savior and your hope for heaven and forgiveness. 
Oh, you may have walked down an aisle. You may have gotten broken over an experience. You may be a deacon in the church, but the reality of it is, is you know that you don't have a relationship with him because your life does not show the growing conformity to the person of Jesus as we see described by Jesus in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. context of these words will be final judgment they die and go to hell thinking that they're going to go to heaven I mean why else would they have said to him wait wait Tom Lord Lord what do you mean we're going over with the goats what what do you mean we were church members we were tithers we what are you saying did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty miracles in your name what are you saying Depart from me, for I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. You look at these works and you think, what in the world could be wrong with them? Even their so-called right works were sinful because they were man-centered rather than Christ-centered. It was about what they did, not about whose they were. So Jesus closes with this final clarifying illustration. He says in verse 24, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Warren Wiersbe helps us here. He says this, he says, The final test is not what we think about ourselves or what others may think about us. The final test is what will God say? How can we be prepared for this judgment? By doing God's will. Obedience to his will is the test of true faith in Christ. You see it there? Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them. We do not get to pick and choose like the religious of Jesus' day. We do not get to reinterpret it. We do not get to be legalistically okay based upon the letter of the law. We look at the spirit of the law. Why? Because we have a new spirit within us that's given us a new heart and new desires, new passions, new abilities that we're able to live that we could not live before no matter how hard we tried. And we know that there's been a change. We do them because he is God and we are not. That's the whole essence of salvation. True faith is obedient faith. Seen in a life of true and righteous character, please judge yourself rightly before it's too late. The picture Jesus gives us here is of two houses that represent two different lives. The person with an authentic And true righteousness not only hears the word of God, but does, obeys, and applies it to their lives. They do not pick and choose what part of the word is important. And they certainly do not limit their access to God's word to only when it's convenient for them. They look at it, they study it, and they think about how does this work in our culture today? One that came to my my mind this morning was... I hear a lot of people make fun of Minish and Ammonite, uh, Mennonite and Amish people. I mean, I, I just put those two words together. That's good. Mennonite and Amish people because of the way that they dress. First of all, that's just that's nothing but in disrespect and unloving attitudes toward them. At least they care about what God thinks about the way they dress. We got a lot of people around here uh, wearing underwear as outerwear, acting like that's no big deal. It don't matter that it's hot and you're swimming. Put some clothes on. God's called us to be holy, not raunchy. Beware, beware, beware. What you put into your eyes, what you put into your ears, the lyrics of the songs you listen to and the shows you watch make a difference. Are they holy and different from that of the world? 
It's amazing to me how even the lost recently got real angry, angry about some dance show on Netflix because, because it shows little girls making raunchy moves. Well, have you been to some of those dance clubs? Listen, they're not all bad, but some of them are. Beware, beware, beware. Your decisions are changed because of your relationship with Jesus, because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. You want to be like the world, then go to hell. You want to be like Jesus, then you're going to be hated by the world. You will be reviled, you will be persecuted, you will be lied about. People will be all up in your grill trying to get you in trouble. Even in the church. Man, people will gripe about the temperature, they'll gripe about worship, they'll gripe about sound, they'll gripe, gripe about us changing their Sunday school room, but they won't gripe about sin and grieve over sin in the world. It should not be. crazy thing is these houses of faith look the same on the outside but verse 24 and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. The rains, the floods, the winds, the storms of life and judgment are coming to us all. If you have built on the rock of Jesus on the gospel and on God's word, then keep on building on it. Why? Because storms and trials reveal the character, strength, and object of our faith. It shows us in whom and in what we truly trust. And, 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 and many of y'all know that the biggest persecutors for Michelle and me have been our own families. The biggest mockers as new believers were those people that knew us the way we used to live. And when we walk in the room, we brought conviction with us because they knew their lives didn't match up to what they see, saw God doing in our lives. And rather than get right and repent, they just made fun of us and they mocked us. And it was hard, yes. It was devastating, yes. It was paralyzing sometimes because these are the people that you thought your whole life were to be the least somebody's going to be loyal and devoted to us if nobody else is. But no, it happened just the way Jesus describes. What he described in the first century is the exact same thing that happens to every true believer in the 21st century. Kingdom righteousness flows from repentant gospel faith. You, are, you now know that you're loved and you're accepted in Jesus. You are secure in Christ forever. So when the storms of judgment come, only the sheep who have heard God's word and obeyed it, not perfectly, but consistently and diligently, will survive these storms. And the reason is because our sin was judged and dealt with on the cross. We recognize with great gratitude and great impact that that is not just some piece of jewelry that you wear so that you can claim to be a Christian. That is a picture of sacrificial love that motivates everything we do in life. I mean, it has changed everything about us. And that's why we're unashamed. That's why we're devoted. Even when we're mocked and we're persecuted and we're made fun of. Here's what Galatians 2.20 says. We have been crucified with Christ and we no longer live. But Christ lives in us. The life we now live, we live by faith in the Son of God who loves us and died. 
See, we live the obedient life because we've been given a new life in Christ, safe and secure forever. So at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter to us what everybody else says about us. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter how they make fun of us. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter how we are distinct from them and how we are ostracized because we don't do the same sin and run into it the way they do. People that were once very close to us, we no longer feel comfortable with, and they don't feel comfortable with us, and so they don't want to call us anymore. They don't want to invite us anymore. They don't want to be around us anymore. When you get saved, y'all, It changes everything about you one day, one decision, one thought, one one, uh, 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 life at a time. You see, the lost self-righteous people are going to fall with a great crash, experiencing horrible suffering in hell forever, where there's going to be a weeping and gnashing of teeth and a lack, the lack of God's gracious and loving presence. That which we presume on today will not get to it after we die. You see, the storms and the trials and the temptations of life are coming, but, but the self-righteous dead faith is really faith in yourself, your own concept of faith. So when life gets tough or commitments conflict, you resort to your way, to your decisions, what you think is best, rather than what the Word clearly says. You see, when life is easy for the self-righteous, you have your own type of faith. God's word directs your path only when you agree with it. In fact, the self-righteous are proving that really they're still their own God. Their words, their thoughts, their opinions, their ideals, their preferences are more important than what God says in his word. Beware. I just beg you not to face judgment self-deceived with a false peace. Real faith, true faith is spirit-enabled, new heart-desiring obedience to God's word. It's, it's just changed everything about you. And so when commitments conflict, when the word of God and your opinion or your understanding of it conflict, who wins? What wins? Your thoughts? Your opinions? Your your preferences or God's word? What wins? It's only, you're only enabled to walk in obedience because you're a new creation in Christ. So please judge yourself rightly today. If your life is lived founded upon and passionately desiring to live obedient to God's word, you can be confident that you will grow and learn in the days to come. So compare yourself to the word, not the Christian world. Not to other Christians in here. And I submit to you, not even to the old you. Just because you've grown a little bit, that doesn't mean that you truly got saved. That just means that you grew up. I mean, I think about all the ways I changed from whenever I was immature and didn't know nothing when I thought I knew everything. I mean, the longer I went to college, the smarter my mama got. I just matured in my understanding of life and wisdom and what was right and what was wrong from that perspective, not from a spirit-filled, God-enabled perspective. So make sure that you've turned to God in repentant gospel faith, trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ alone as your only hope and forgiveness in heaven. If you have, your faith will lead to a life marked by obedience to God's word, digging deep. Building on the right foundation, you can't get enough of him. You will spend time with him because he is the greatest love of your life. Everybody else may not always love you perfectly, but Jesus does. And so you spend time with him because you need him. But if you haven't seen this life change, and maybe you think today obedience is optional when convenient, often unnecessary understand that your life and your faith is still about you if you find yourself excusing your sin and justifying your sin instead of dealing with your sin that's a red flag if you find yourself making excuses for the wickedness of others and still saying in spite of a lifestyle of wickedness that yes surely they still know jesus you may be damning people to hell with you beware beware 
please don't gamble with your eternity or anyone else's. Verse 28. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. You see, I surrender to you that this, herein lies the real problem of a fake, self-righteous faith. They miss seeing Jesus as God with authority, the final authority for what kingdom righteousness really looks like. So here's what I'm saying. Is that some of you didn't even consider doing what I asked you to do last week and use Matthew chapter 5 verse 7 as a mirror into your soul. As an identification as to whether or not you really have a character and a lifestyle and a desire and a passion like he says true righteousness looks like in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And so I'll beg you again to do it today. This week, consider it. First time in my life, after, after I asked you guys to do that, that's what I studied every day in my quiet time this week. Meditating upon that, praying that, evaluating about that. Because what I've learned always in my Christian life, when I hear messages like this, if I'm too arrogant to consider that it applies to me, it is proof that I'm going to hell. If I can think, man, there's no way, yeah, Butch, preach it. They need to hear it today. But you don't think it could be you, even though your life don't match up. Beware. Satan has no problem when you come to church. He has no problem with you being a church member. He has no problem with you being a leader in the church. But he doesn't want you to come into a relationship with Jesus. Because that changes everything. And I think that you all know that Michelle and I tried this. This, this, righteous, this self-righteous path, even as leaders in the church, before we gave our lives to Jesus Christ. And this crowd was blown away. Some believed, but most didn't, the gospel that he preached, the, the good news that he offered, so different than the religious of his day. And so I just ask you, what about you? Have you really come to a point in your life where you recognize that you are a sinner in trouble? Truly in trouble apart from a personal faith relationship with, with God. In other words, you're a liar. You're a th thief. You're an adulterer because you're lusting. You are unholy. You are living a life contrary to what the, the God in human flesh has taught in Matthew 5 through 7. Are, are you willing to admit and acknowledge that if you don't have Jesus, you ain't got no hope? Do you believe that Jesus has done for you, saved you, borne your, God's wrath towards you, your sin on the cross. That he hung, that that ain't just jewelry. That is a symbol of your death in Christ. You're identifying with Christ in his death as he has taken your place. He is your substitute, paying the penalty for your sin, removing your shame. Are you willing to confess that to him, acknowledge that to him, but not just to him, but to others? Are you willing to live unashamed when your friends and your family are living in ways, when you're are, are contradicting God's ways? Are you willing to stand for him, or do you just keep your mouth shut? Are you ashamed to be identified with his holiness his words and his ways. Now listen, I'm not telling you that the Amish and Mennonites got it right. I'm just saying that at least they're trying. So many in the church today. We're not even trying to act like we're trying to be obedient to this book. Beware. Hell is forever. Man, I don't want any of y'all to hear those words. Depart from me. I never knew you. Because when you come to know Jesus, increasingly you care less and less about what everybody else thinks about you. Because you're right with the creator, God of the universe. They can make fun of you. They can mock you. They can do whatever they want. Because if you got Jesus, you got it going on. And that's the way you're going to live your life. You are ready to go out those doors, living large for him, being fashionable for him, 
impressing him no matter what everybody else thinks about you. And Yellow Creek, if we ever expect to be God's church, then we need a redeemed membership, not lost membership. So make sure that you're saved today. Because then what you're telling me is if you don't get saved here and your life's not changed, I'm getting to hold you accountable as a Christian. And so I'm going to be ticking you off all the time when I preach the word. Okay, like, like, let me just give you one example. The staff, we're talking about how can we best organize the rooms uh, that we have available because we have very limited Sunday school and nursery rooms. How are we going to best do that so that when people visit us, they think, oh, wow, that's where this age group is and that's where this age group is and that's where this age group is. Man, we start moving people around in rooms, you fit to see people go crazy. You're taking my room away from me? It ain't your room. It never was your room. It's his room. It's a resource that y'all came together and paid for so that people could get saved and discipled so that other people could get saved and discipled. Don't act like a baby. Oh, I'm about to get roll. I'm about to get going now. But the reality of it is some of the meanest people I meet in my life call themselves Christian. You read some of their posts and I just go, and then I just, so I don't usually, I don't handle it in public. I'll just private message them. I said, man, that wasn't very biblical. I have one girl go off on me so bad, I just had to mute her, man, because she just was so angry and mean. She didn't want to hear the truth. She hates all Christians now, but she calls herself a Christian. Beware, y'all. The deceiver is good at what he does. And I don't want any of y'all to be deceived. On the, the guest card on the back of it, there's a gospel track to, to reinforce everything that I said today. But listen, all that the Bible says you need to do is believe. To place your hope, your trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ alone is your only hope for forgiveness in heaven. And the only way that you can know that you've really done that instead of just gone through the motions is that you see life change. If you don't see it, get saved today. And then the only way you know you really got saved is you begin to see God give you new desires, new passions, new abilities, new freedoms that you've never enjoyed in your life. It's beautiful, the power of the gospel. And that's what the world wants to know. Is your, is your God any different than the other gods? You bet he is. Yeah, he put skin on, came, lived a sinless life, died a cruel death, got buried because he really died. But on the third day, rose, rose victorious over sin and death, just like he said he would. Why? Because he bore the sins of the world, and God was satisfied with that. So all who believe see him as our sin-bearing, wrath-removing Savior from hell. We do not have to worry about hell again. So we live large for Jesus Christ. Let that be our testimony, Yellow Creek. Let that be your testimony as an individual. And if it hasn't been to this point, get saved today. Would you pray with me? Father, no more games, no more going through the motions, just trusting in you. Understanding and admitting that we're sinners in need of a Savior. Believing, trusting in, placing our confidence and our only hope in the finished work of Jesus Christ alone is our hope for salvation. Letting you know that personally and then letting the world know that by the way we live our lives. That we are unashamed of our Savior. We are unashamed of the gospel. We are unashamed of living differently than the world because you are enough. Oh, you're enough. And heaven for eternity is so much better than heaven that this earth gives. Oh, Lord, let us delay our gratifications to live to please you for your kingdom and your glory, I pray. God, save and change and set free in this place today, I pray. For Christ's sake, amen. Would you please stand and respond as the Spirit of God lays on your heart to respond.